بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا فما بعد ما يا brothers and sisters الحمد لله as I keep saying over and over again دعوت الإسلام is about living Islam Although Dawah of Islam can be done in many ways by speaking, by publishing books and literature, by uh, you know all kinds of means, but the most powerful way of presenting Islam to the world, of propagating Islam, is by living Islam. And this was the way of the Anbiya alayhi salam, of the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jalla Jalalhu and the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Anbiya did not publish books. The Anbiya did not give long lectures. The Anbiya lived Islam. All of them. Including Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as I said, nothing wrong with doing these things. When I say the Anbiya did not publish books, I am not suggesting that publishing a book is a crime. No, of course it is not. That is also a way of, of presenting Islam. Alhamdulillah. But the most powerful way, the purest form, the most blessed form is to live Islam. Now, obviously, this is, it's a no-brainer to understand that um, the reason for that is that Islam is the name of a practice. Islam is not the name of a theory or a theology or uh, something like that. It is the name of a practice and the best way of learning a practice is by practice. So if somebody wants to learn about Islam, the best way that they have is to be in touch with a Muslim, is to meet a Muslim, talk to a Muslim, visit a Muslim home, uh, deal with a Muslim in business, right? Spend time with a Muslim, travel with a Muslim, uh, have some dealings with a Muslim, all of these are extremely powerful ways of opening the heart of that other individual to Islam and to the goodness of Islam. Provided. And that is the catch. Provided. Provided all of these experiences are positive experiences. Where a person goes into a Muslim home and is impressed by the cleanliness, by the by, by, the, by the hospitality, right? I'm not talking about wealth and, and opulence. There's this beautiful uh, true story of recent times of this Danish couple, uh, Danish or Dutch, I can't, uh, can't recall exactly, but I think it was Danish, who were in Turkey on a holiday and they were driving around. So, they were in this, uh, I think it was in the Anatolia, that part of Turkey. Very, very beautiful. The whole, the whole area, the whole you know, country itself is very beautiful. But some parts of it are even more beautiful than others. So these people were there in this place and they were driving around in this. Uh, and um, it started getting dark. Then eventually they ended up in a very small uh, uh, sort of village. And uh, they were trying to now find it was it was cold, uh, it was winter. It was not there was no ice and snow, but it was very cold. Uh, so they were they wanted to find some shelter, some food, but uh, they wanted I mean, they couldn't find a restaurant, they couldn't find a hotel or a, or, or any any place to, to to stay. And so they were parked in the uh, in 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 the in the town square. Uh, they met somebody. And they asked this person, and you know, between Turkish and, and English, and this guy is a Danish anyway. Uh, so eventually they got through the message that they were looking for shelter, looking for some food. So this person, this Turkish Turkish uh, man, he said, please come home, I come, come and stay with us. You know, because there is no hotel here, there's no hotel here, there's no restaurant here, please come. So they went to their house, and uh, this Danish uh, couple, they said it was a very small house, it was literally like, you know, uh, one room or something, very small house, and you know, they, they took us into this, into this uh, main uh, 
living room and uh, he said we sat on the floor because that's how this they sit on on you know with bolsters uh, so we sat on the floor then uh, this this man uh, he introduced his wife she came and they had uh, you know two two or three children so they all came and uh, then they brought the food uh, so we had this meal with them it was a very beautiful meal we thoroughly enjoyed the meal ate to our to our fill and uh, then this, uh, these people, they said, well, you know, we uh, don't have a separate bedroom, uh, but make yourself comfortable here. They brought uh, blankets for us. They brought pillows for us. And uh, they said, you can sleep in this room. Uh, no problem. And they opened the, an the, another door and they left. So this man said, well, you know, this is very good. I mean, they have gone to sleep in their, in their bedroom and I'm sleeping here and my wife and I are sleeping. So we slept very comfortably, very peacefully. And uh, then he said, early in the morning, um, he said, I got up and uh, I wanted to go uh, out. <clears throat> I wanted to see if there was a you know, toilet or something. Um, so he was opening the door. So he obviously he knew the front door he came through. So he knew that was not the way to the toilet. So he said he opened the other door through which this family had left the previous night. And he says to his amazement, absolute amazement, that turned out to be the back door of the house. So that door was not leading into another room. That door was leading again out of the house. This house was just this one room. And he says to my absolute astonishment, when I opened that door and I looked out, what do I see? He said, I see this family under a tree all covered up with blankets and so on, sleeping under a tree. The man said, I completely blew my mind. He said, I started weeping. And I said, what kind of people are these? What kind of people are these? I, we are strangers. We are, we are European. We are strangers. We are not from their religion. We are Christian. These are Muslims. They owe us nothing, absolutely. They bring us home, they feed us, they give us their sleeping space to sleep and they go and sleep outside under a tree in this cold. He said, I came back inside, I told my wife the story. And as soon as we saw those people, which was, you know, maybe a few minutes later or, or whatever, a little bit later, these two, they became Muslim. They accepted Islam. They said, we want this religion of yours. What made you do this? What made you do this? Not one word of preaching, not one pamphlet, not one book, not, not one lecture, no YouTube, nothing. Just plain living Islam. This is how powerful living Islam is. And I can tell you story after story after story. There was a wonderful story which was doing the rounds after 9-11. There was this Pakistani taxi driver who picked up this young lady and drove her God knows to another state and dropped her safely home and came back. Same story. Why did he do that? because he is Muslim. He didn't even take money from her because when she offered, she, she said, no, this is a time of distress. We are all extremely upset. We, this terrible thing has happened. We, we want to, we need to help one another. So I'm helping you. I just want to make sure that you get home safely to your family because your family is obviously very worried about what happened to you. I want to make sure that your family, you get home safely to your family, that you, are, that you don't come to any harm. That is enough. That's payment for me that this has been, that I have been able to do that. Another great story where this, yeah, this lady, single mother with her children, they had to move from one state to another. So they got a, 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 a U-Haul, but she needed somebody to drive the U-Haul. So she had this U-Haul driver who was a Muslim, the bearded guy. So she says that as we were driving down the highway, 
uh, it was, you know, sun was setting. And I noticed that this uh, driver kept on looking in the rear view mirror. And she said, I was driving behind him. And uh, after a while, I got a bit worried. I said, why is he continuously looking in the rear view mirror? He's obviously looking at, uh, at me and my car. Why is he doing that? And she said, eventually, where there was, where he could legally do that, he pulled over and he stopped. Now she said, well, I had to stop because this is my U-Haul, it's all my worldly possessions in this, uh, in this truck. And uh, she was really worried now, right? And she was, she was wondering whether she should call uh, the, uh, you know, the, the highway police or something. When he got out of the U-Haul, he came up to her car and he said, ma'am, please, I need five minutes. It is now time for my prayer, evening prayer. And uh, I was looking in the rearview mirror because that's where the sun is. And uh, I, it's now time for me to pray. So please give me five minutes and I will finish my prayer and then we'll be on our way. The woman said, I was absolutely shocked. This man is driving his truck on the highway and time for prayer comes. He stops. So she said he went back to his truck, he pulled out his prayer mat from his, uh, from his cabin and then on the grass verge uh, he prayed and she said, I just saw him pray. I said, she, she said, this was so beautiful to see a man in connection with his God. To see a man or woman connected to their creator. One of my very dear friends who recently retired, she was, she, she was a senior, senior uh, counselor officer in the U.S. Embassy in India. This African-American lady who is Muslim. But she told, her, she, told, she told me many, many years ago, she told me her story of how she came to Islam. And she came to Islam because she was studying in the university that she was studying in. There was this Malaysian girl who was her roommate. That Malaysian girl did not tell her one word about Islam. In the entire period that they were together, she did not preach Islam at all. She didn't say one single word. But what she did was, she said, this girl never missed a single prayer. Never missed a single prayer. So time for Salah, this girl would pray. And this, at that time, Christian, African-American roommate of hers would watch her pray. A woman in connection with her Rabb, Jalla Jalalu. And she said that this was so powerful for me that before we parted company, I told her, please explain this thing to me. What, what are you doing? And that resulted in her accepting Islam. There are any number of such stories. The question is, are we going to be readers of such stories? Or are we going to become those stories? That's the question. Because if we simply are readers of, of such stories, it's worthless. What is worthwhile, what must happen, is for us to become the stuff of these stories. It is the practice of Islam which is the most powerful form of Dao. And that's why my advice to myself and you is, let us look at our lives. Let us look at every aspect of our lives. How do I behave at home? How do I behave in my workplace? How do I behave when I go shopping? How do I behave when I'm driving on the road? How do I behave when I'm in public transport? How do I behave when I'm with my elders? How do I behave when I'm with children? And so on and so on. How do I behave when I'm happy? 
How do I behave when I am sad, when I am heartbroken? How do I behave when I am angry, when I am furious? All of these <coughs> are messages to the world. <coughs> Obviously, these are a reflection of who I am. And these are messages to the world. And whether we like it or not, the world interprets them as this is a Muslim. This is a Muslim. So it's no use moaning and groaning and complaining and saying, why must people always look at me as a Muslim? Why don't they look at me as Yawar Beg? I don't say that I'm very happy. Let people look at me as a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy about that. I'm perfectly confident about that. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect me and to protect my tongue and to protect my ways that I'm never a disgrace to my religion. And if I ever make a mistake, then I'm... And as soon as that mistake is pointed out to me, then I try to make sure that I'm the first person to apologize, the first person to... Uh, to try to make amends for that mistake. And that's the, real, that's the reality for all of us. We all make mistakes. But the door of forgiveness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the door of seeking forgiveness from people is always open until we die. So people will always see you as a Muslim, as a man or woman, and they will take your behavior and interpret it as their experience of Islam. We have no choice over that. People will do that. And believe it or not, people used to do that from day one. People have always done that from the time of Rasulullah. The difference is that the Sahaba didn't complain about that. The Sahaba actually invited people to do that. They said, you want to know what is Islam? Look at us. Kunu mislana. Become like us. You want to know what is Islam? Look at us. Now, even if you don't do that, because at least I don't feel confident enough to tell somebody, you want to know, you want to know about Islam, look at me. I'm content to try to do my best and leave it at that. But definitely, we can say that to ourselves and say, people are looking at me and seeing me as a representative of Islam as a representative of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whether we like it or not people are going to see us as that people do see us as that so the choice we have is how do I want that picture to be People are going to experience me, my speech, my behavior, my treatment, my dealings, and they are going to interpret, uh, interpret those as a reflection of Islam, not as a reflection of me as an individual divorced from my religion, because I'm not divorced from my religion. They're going to interpret my behavior and all of that as a reflection of Islam. So what choice do I have? I do not have a choice, as I mentioned earlier, to stop them from making that interpretation. The choice I have is, what impression do I want to create? What do I want them to take away from that interaction with me? That Islam is worth looking at? To become positively interested in Islam? Or to see Islam as a net negative thing, which even if they can't get rid of, at least they wish that it didn't exist. You know, I've said this in uh, many places, but I think it's an important thing to say. Think about this. <clears throat> if mobile technology, our mobile phones disappeared from the face of the earth. Suddenly one morning you wake up and you find that your phone is dead. It's a piece of metal. 
And it happens to a lot of people. I, I had a phone which turned into a piece of metal. I freaked out. And it need not, that need not happen. How many of us have not had this, had this experience that we go to some place and suddenly we find there's no signal. And you find people looking, oh my God, there's no signal. Oh my God, there's no signal. Oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. <laughs> no signal, big deal, so what? But so what is not the case. We get panicky. No signal. We stop the guy right there and say, who, right now, who do you want to talk to? Nobody. Are you expecting an urgent message or phone call from somebody? No. So what does it matter to you if there is no signal? Shut the phone. No. My phone must be with me. It must ring, even if it's in the masjid. As soon as Salah finishes, I mean, sometimes I, 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 I try to jokingly make this point with my, with my friends. As soon as Salah finishes, Salaam Alaikum, Salaam Alaikum, instantly phone comes out of the pocket. So sometimes I ask people, is there an app here to say Salah accepted, not accepted? Is that what you're checking? <coughs> you just finished praying, now you pulled out your phone, so are you, are you looking at your Salah acceptance app to show you whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted your Salah or not? What is this? Not even time to say Astaghfirullah. Not even time to to uh, to send Salat and Salam on Rasulullah Sallam. Not even not even time to make the Masnoon Rathkar after first Salah. Instantly phone comes out to look at what are you looking at? Juma is going on. It is against the uh, adab of Juma for us to be doing anything other than listening to the Khatib and Imam. And then praying behind him. Nothing else. Including if somebody says, Salam Alaikum, you are not even supposed to say, Wa Alaikum As Salam, if you are in Juma. But despite that, in the Juma, you pull the phone out. So, supposing one day you wake up and you find that no phones. As I told you, I just gave you examples of what happens even if we lose signal for a few minutes. There is this sense of loss. There is a sense of panic. At varying degrees, I'm not saying everybody is equally panicked. Mercifully, some people have some sense. But the point is, even the ones with the greatest of sense will have some twinge. They will have some prick to say, oh, I don't have signal. Oh, my phone is not working. As I told you, even though they don't need the phone right then for anything, despite that. Why is that? Because we see this technology as beneficial for us. And of course, technology is technology is value neutral. If you use it, use if you use it for good things, it is beneficial. If not, it's not. But the point is that that technology is definitely potentially useful. So, because it is potentially useful, we treat it with respect. And if it disappears, if it goes away, we feel very. We feel odd, we feel bad, we feel, oh my God, what happened? I wish it was back. Now think about this. If the world wakes up tomorrow morning and there are no Muslims, no Muslims, no Masajid, no Madaris, no signs of Islam, no Adhan, no men with topis and beards, no women with hijab, no sign of it. It's as if Islam never existed. Supposing they wake up in the morning and they find that everything is gone. What will they say? What will they feel? Will they say or feel the same thing like you and I, that I that, like the example I just gave you, which is that if mobile technology disappears, phones disappear, there will be panic. People will see it as a net loss. People will moan and groan and they will grieve and they will say, oh my God, what happened? Bring it back right now. We want it. This was so good for us. Why did it go? Where did it go? Do you think the same thing will happen? The non-Muslims, because Muslims have disappeared. Who's left? Non-Muslims. Will the non-Muslims come out in the streets and say, where are the Muslims? Bring them back. These are beautiful people. These are great people. We love them. These are our friends. These people help us. 
These people are always there standing up to fight for our, for our causes. These people are always there to back us. These people are the people we go to and they stand up for us. We respect these people, we love these people, bring them back. Where did they go? Why did they go? Is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? And I won't act out the opposite. It's, I think it's more than obvious. Or maybe people will not dance with joy in the streets to say, finally we got rid of them. Maybe they are indifferent. Like sparrows disappeared from, from, our, from our homes and gardens in Hyderabad. How many people even noticed? We don't have any sparrows. We don't have any hoopoes. We don't even have minas. All we have is pigeons. How many people notice? Is it going to, is that what do you think is going to happen? One of which of which of these? And what does that tell you? What does that tell you? About how we are viewed by our constituents. Why do I say constituents? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Allah said, you are the best of people and you have been extracted, you have been taken out and selected for the benefit of mankind. Ukhrijat linnas. What do you do? Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhauna anil munkari wa tuminuna billah. You enjoin, you promote, you invite towards, you facilitate, you help in everything which is good. Al ma'ruf, well known, good. Wa tanhauna anil munkar. And you stop and you discourage and you prevent and you guard and you guide away from everything which is harmful, everything which is evil. Right? وَتُوْمِنُنَا billah, And you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our constituents are the rest of the world. And what's our job? To benefit them in every possible way. Every possible way. One of the most important is to present Islam to them. But the door to Islam, the route to presenting Islam comes through problem solving for them standing up for them, helping them when they have difficulties, taking away, alleviating their pain, feeding them when they are hungry, clothing them when they need clothing, giving them shelter when they don't have shelter, standing up for their rights, even at our own expense, Only and only to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the route to presenting Islam. A hungry belly makes deaf ears. People don't want to listen to lectures on theology when the belly is empty. First feed, first clothe, first shelter. First help, first give medicine, then talk about Islam and for the most part you do not need to talk about Islam because they are seeing you, they are seeing where it's coming from. One of the finest examples of this as we speak is what is happening in South Africa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and make a lot of dua for South Africa. Beautiful country, Muslim population is 1%. One and a half percent, perhaps, not more than that. Make a lot of dua for them. Right now it's going through enormous turmoil. There is practically the equivalent of a civil war happening in South Africa. 
There's looting, widespread looting and arson and all kinds of stuff. And in the middle of all that, what are the Muslims doing? They're distributing food, they're distributing bread, they're distributing milk. Masajid have been opened and they've become shelters for people who need shelter. Masajid have opened and they have, they are, they are sheltering people, they're giving them medicines. They're giving them food, they're giving them clothing. Muslims have stood up in, in, in uh, non-Muslim areas which were likely to be attacked. Muslims have provided security. They have gone there, and gone there, surrounded the place and stood there. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. May all power to South African Muslim brothers and sisters and to their ulama and to their leaders. This is right now. As I speak, this is what is happening in South Africa. I keep getting it because I, it's, South Africa is like a, like a second home to me and I've got so many very, very dear friends of mine there. So I am very concerned about them. I am extremely concerned about their safety. So I am in regular touch with them. And they are sending me this, inf this, this information. And this is not, it's not them telling me. They are sending me, for example, screenshots of, of, uh, of, from Twitter. Uh, screenshots from Facebook. I am not on Facebook, but they are sending me screenshots from Facebook and Twitter of non-Muslims commenting about the behavior of Muslims in South Africa at this time. Now you know and I know if that, that if the behavior had been negative, that would have hit the, you know, it would have hit the fan. That goes without saying. But all power to people who are fair, that they don't hide the good. That when it is good, they also publicize. Alhamdulillah. People are going there. And these are people who can even afford to pay. They're going there they're because they, they, the shops are all shut. I mean, food, food supplies are cut. They're going there, they're taking bread and milk and other food supplies for their families. They're saying, can I pay for it? They say, no, this is free. Please take it. There are grown men and women standing there with the bread and the food and, and the milk in their hands, weeping tears. And saying, what kind of people are these? You are also affected by this. It's not as if the Muslims are protected. No. That's what they said, that these are the people whose shops have been burnt. These are the people who lost all their, all their possessions. Their shops were burnt and looted. And what are they doing? They're standing there distributing food to others. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. <coughs> South African... بھائی اور بہنوں نے سارے عالم کے مسلمانوں کی لاج رکھ لی الحمدللہ اللہ تبارک و تعالی جل شان ہو آپ کا گواہ ہے میں دعا کرتا ہوں کہ اللہ آپ کو اپنے شان کے مطابق اس کا عجر انعیت فرمائے اور اب اللہ تبارک و تعالیٰ آپ کی اور آپ کے آپ کی اور آپ کے خاندانوں کی اور آپ کے مال کی اور آپ کے عزت کی اور سب سے بڑھ کے آپ کے ایمان کی خاص اللہ تبارک و تعالیٰ خود اپنی قدرت سے اپنی شان سے اپنی قوت سے حفاظت فرمائے اللہ سبحانہ وتعالیٰ جل شانہ ہو is your witness and I make dua that Allah سبحانہ وتعالیٰ should protect you and your families and your wealth and your, and, and, and your possessions and your property and above all your Iman with His power and with His majesty and with His glory, inshaAllah. This is, the, this is the, the, the image, the picture of Islam that we want to see, my brothers and sisters. These Muslims in South Africa, they are not standing there making bayats. They are helping people. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of examples in many parts of the world. Right here in America, we had it right through the COVID period, from 2019 onwards. Masjid after masjid, distributing food. In our masjid also, in ISW, Alhamdulillah, we had like a, almost like, a, like, like, like Costco in the, in, inside the masjid. The big hall was full of food. Full of food supplies and people were free. They would just come in 
The only rule was wear a mask, but come in and, you know, take what you need. All free, donated by our Muslim brothers and sisters in, in, in uh, West Springfield. And this is not unique. They were, this, this happened, this story was repeated all over America, Alhamdulillah. Muslims coming to the aid and help of others. Muslim restaurant owners inviting homeless people to just come, eat your fill and go. No problem. No charge. We need good stories. We need good news. Alhamdulillah. And I'm very delighted and I'm very happy that, I, that when, I, when I say we need good news, I don't have to go and, you know, do one sort of a great hunt for it and search for it in, in nooks and, and crannies. It's right here, alhamdulillah, open before our eyes. May Allah bless our brothers and sisters. We need to multiply this. Living Islam is about multiplying this. Every masjid must become a center of goodness. And like a candle which radiates its light and takes away the darkness from a room, every masjid must become that. Every Muslim home must become that. Every Muslim business must become that. Alhamdulillah, we have one of our brothers here in, in West Springfield who feeds uh, homeless people every week after Friday. After Juma Salah, his wife cooks the food and he feeds them uh, outside his shop uh, in downtown West Springfield. I mean, I would have mentioned his name, but I know he would not want me to do that. Alhamdulillah. We need to multiply this. Focus on being beneficial. Focus on being increasingly beneficial. In your own way. Whatever is your way. Teach people, for example, reading and writing. Help children with their homework. Go clean up somebody's yard. Some elderly people, they need help to buy things from the grocery store, go buy it for them. Go to hospitals. Alhamdulillah, you have money. How many people in India are suffering because they don't have money to pay hospital bills? Go to hospitals and settle their bills for them. How many people are, are, are languishing in prison because they don't have money to pay bail? They can get out and go home, but they need to pay the bill and they have no money, they have no one to help them. Go there and say, I am here to pay bail money for whoever is eligible to go home on bail. Pay their bail money, let them, let them go out. If you don't want to go physically and do it, set up organizations in your towns, in your cities, donate to those organizations and then somebody will, your people in the organization will go and do that for you. But set up, focus on being beneficial to everybody. Every project, town cleanup project must have Muslims in it. Water projects must have Muslims in it. Garbage collection projects must have Muslims in it. Food distribution projects must have Muslims in it. Schools, Muslims in it. Every beneficial thing must have a Muslim face and many Muslim faces in it. This is our goal in life. Take, take it like this. Say that this is my, my goal in life is to be beneficial to people, whatever the nature of that benefit. As long as I'm not being asked to do something which is prohibited in Islam, and you won't be asked. Nobody will ask you to distribute uh, alcohol or, or distribute marijuana. It doesn't matter whether it's legal or not legal. In Islam, it is haram. Stick to the book of Allah and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu and focus our attention on becoming progressively more and more beneficial to everyone. Spread this word in your families to the youngest of your children. Make sure your children do that and believe me, they enjoy it. They love it. Little children like nothing better than to be doing things for other people. 
ingrain it in, in themselves as a habit which they will carry with them. As they grow, the habit grows with them. Their memory of being beneficial will be with them as their biggest strength throughout their lives. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla who, to enable us to be beneficial as He intended us to be beneficial. And we ask Allah to help us in that and to protect us while we do that and to accept it from us and to reward us in keeping with His Majesty and Grace. Wa sallallahu ala nabil kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika wa 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 rah